And I'm going to go straight to our teach today. And um, the Father, bless us, Lord God, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. The body of my message today is lifted from, and it's really inspired by Paul. He was a great expositor of the word. Uh, he was a great propagator of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel, this is why Jesus came, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He spread the gospel throughout, throughout Europe. I'm just giving a little background before I get to my text. And he was a highly educated man, and he had many, many missionary journeys. And within those journeys, he experienced hardships, experienced shipwrecks, and even imprisonment, all for the gospel. But he didn't let that stop him. In one of his writings, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus because it is the power. And so he didn't let prison stop him. He was shipwrecked many times, but he didn't let the storm stop him. We're going to read about one of those experiences now in his life that occurred on his way towards Rome as a prisoner. But before we read that chapter, in previous chapters, we see that he gained many enemies because of his mission. One time, the Bible says a crowd, the Bible described them as a mob that came to kill him and to beat him. And he was put in prison all because he spoke truth, the unadulterated word of God. The Bible says that his mission was to help save people's lives from the clutches of Satan. So he became a prisoner, and we're going to pick up in Acts 27. I'm going to hop, skip, and jump a few verses here. And the Bible says, when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some of the other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the imperial regiment. The Bible then says, we boarded a ship from Andramatium about to sail for the ports along the coast of the province of Asia. We put out to sea Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. Keep going. We made slow headway. This is verse 7 we're in now. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snidus when the wind did not allow us to hold our course. We sailed to the lee of Crete opposite Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Haven near the town of Lassie. And as a result of this, much time had been lost. Sailing had already become dangerous because by now, it was after the Day of Atonement. So this was a windy season at the time of atonement. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Verse 13. 
when a gentle south wind, so here's a little rest bite now from their journey. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Verse 14. I wonder what version have you got for me here? Verse 14. I like the King James Version. It sounds very poetic. It says, but not long after that. So just when everything, it seemed peaceful and the wind had died down. There arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. This Greek translation is a typhonic wind. A whirlwind, a hurricane, blowing in all directions. And so we pick up again in verse 13 when it says, The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of, of a small island called Calder, we hardly were able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted, hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid they would run aground around on the sandbars of Sretis. They lowered the sea anchor and let so the ship is just being driven along by the wind. We took such a violent battering from the storm. I wonder if anyone has taken a violent battering from the storms in your life. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began, so they began to panic. Have you ever been in a storm where you've taken such a battering that you begin to panic? And so this is what happened here, and they threw their cargo overboard. But Paul says, but now I urge you, keep up your courage. Look at your neighbor and tell them, keep up your courage. Because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Hold it there. So in other words, material things may fade, may fall, and may be destroyed, but you will not be lost. So the Bible says, and I feel my help early, verse 25. So it says, so keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in that. God, it will happen just as he told me. I wonder if you look, can look at your neighbor and just tell him, it will happen just as he told you. This is not my subject matter today, but I don't know what God has told you, but it will happen. I don't know what the enemy has told you contrary to God's word, but if he said it, that settles it. His word will not return unto him void. Once he speaks, life comes into existence. And so today, what I want to talk to you about, I've talked on this topic before, but the content is completely different. It's like a season. It's like a, um, um, a series, if you please. And this is really about knowing your season. Knowing your season. And so when I read this chapter then, I'm really drawn by the varying wind conditions that that Paul has encountered. And I know that there are various, there are countries that have, although we have four seasons, but I remember, you know, when I went to Jamaica, the Caribbean, you know, you had the windy season. 
you know, and then you've got the rainy season. And so my subject matter is really about the different kinds of inclement weather within the seasons of life. And so then in this story, as we look at the weather conditions, I really want to direct your attention today to the wind and see if we can draw some life lessons from it. We're just talking today, all right? And so we're going to focus on three types of wind. Look at your neighbor and tell them, headwind. Look at the other one and tell them, tailwind. And look at the other one and tell them, maybe behind you, crosswind. So that is really what our focus is on today. And so I would start by saying that there are different kinds of winds that we experience in our lives when it comes to the wind. And we sometimes use the wind as metaphors to create what they call a vivid imagery in terms of so you can understand and get a better picture as to a person's situation or what they are going through. I remember the first time that I experienced a, hu a hurricane. It must have been about eight or nine. I can't remember uh, the exact age. And I looked out my window and I saw oak trees just all out of the ground. And that hurricane was Hurricane Gilbert. <laughs> I don't know, maybe some of you are too, too young to know what I'm talking about. Anyone remember Hurricane Gilbert? Hurricane Gilbert was the first hurricane that I encountered. And hurricanes, if things aren't secure, it uproots them. It throws them about if they are not secure. And so when we use metaphors, metaphors then triggers our imagination and it gets us to think outside of the box and uh, metaphors what they do they do what a normal vocabulary cannot do which is create a picture in your mind and one metaphor that we use I wonder if anyone knows this one the wind of change anyone know that one so the wind of change it gives the idea then of the wind blowing in something new. It also means that wind, when wind blows, it cannot be stopped. Which means then that whatever God has said to you, the wind of change in your life that is coming cannot be stopped coming in like a rushing mighty wind. They were on one accord. And suddenly, just when you thought it was all over, the wind of change came into your life. And there are some people that expect you to be at the bottom. But the moment you rise to the top, they have a problem with you. And they try to stop what God is doing in your life. But God is like the wind. It cannot be stopped. Whether they accept it or not, it will happen. I don't know what God has told you and what other people have told you. But God is like the wind. When he comes in and speaks a word... It must happen. Can you say amen? amen? And so we also talk about throwing caution to the wind. You got it. And so this term then, it's a nautical terminology where sailors use this. It is said that it's derived from when sailors throw caution, referring to the wind in order for them to gain maximum speed and use the wind for their advantage. It describes situations when you're 
throwing caution to the wind. It also describes a person or an individual who acts audaciously without worry, without fear, fearlessness in terms of confronting your adversary. But we know that when we throw caution to the wind, it's a different type of wind that we are throwing caution to. The wind, the pneuma, the spirit of God. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. So when we throw caution to the wind, we are putting our trust in God, which causes us then to have a leap of faith, daring faith. So we act without fear. We ought to be a people that acts without fear. And if we, even if we have fear, we have the Holy Spirit to manage our fears. Can you say amen? And so we ought to be fearless. And then there's another one called knocking the wind out of your sails. It's another saying. Which means, this means that someone feels less confident about themselves or less determined to do something because of what somebody has said to you or done to you or how they make you feel. It brings you then, when you have the wind knocked out of your sails, it can bring you to an abrupt end, leaving you breathless, unable, I'm just taking my time here, but I won't be with you too long, leaving you breathless, unable to fight back. But in our series today, and in our theme, which is about marching forward, I declare that no matter who or what tries to knock the wind out of your sails, we're still gonna march forward. We're still going to go forward. Our senior pastor, who we acknowledge him today, and our senior uh, Pastor Donna Maria, we acknowledge them today, but we thank God for the themes that they give to us because those themes stir up our faith. Can you say amen? amen? It stirs up our faith. And in this month, we are going to march forward. Don't know what happened last month, but this month will be a catalyst for us to reach our destiny. You ought to believe it. You ought to believe it. If you believe it, say amen. amen. So when life then throws unexpected surprises, it makes you feel like the wind has been knocked out of your sails, like a boxer punching you in the midriff, leaving you breathless and you go down to your knees. But I want you to understand today that no matter who comes against you, the songwriter says, tell me who can stand before us when we call on that great name. Would someone call the name Jesus in this place? When Jesus marched into the city, into the town, on a donkey and they had the palm trees and they were singing Hosanna. They were shouting Hosanna, which was Aramaic for save us, Lord. I wonder if there's anyone in the building and watching online who would shout on notice, Hosanna! Hosanna! So there is what we call gone with the wind which is to say that life has gone out of you. You've given up. You've gone through so much now. I can't take this. Winds coming in every direction. And you have just gone with 
the wind. Life has gone out of you. But Proverbs 18 tells us that death and life is in the power of the tongue. I wonder if anyone is ready to speak life into your own situation. Don't wait for the preacher to speak life. Don't wait for your neighbor to speak life. But you have power invested in you to speak life into your own situation. In the kitchen, speak life. Frying fish, speak life. Having a shower, speak life. In the toilet, speak life. Even in front of your enemies, speak life. Because the band is not going to be with you when you're out there. You better take the name of Jesus with you and speak his name into the atmosphere. Speak life. I tell you, you got a lot to give God thanks for. Because he's given you life right there. Oh, you ought to thank him that your heart is working blood has been pumped there is life in you to create life in any dead situation you ought to speak to the dry bones that's in your life that should be living can these dry bones live yes they can jeremiah and the conversation with god was about is anything too hard for god there is nothing too hard Hard for God. I've had such an experience with him that you cannot make me doubt him. Uh, whether you want to worship him or not, because of my experience with him, I know that if he'd done it before, he can do it once more. I know that when I was in a dead situation before, and I spoke life. Life came into existence. What makes you think that God changes? I am the Lord. And I change not by two immutable things. He cannot lie. So if he said that you will be the head and not the tail, uh, you better believe it. If he said that you would be a and not beneath. You can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. That's reason why sometimes I praise God the way I do because when I think about the goodness of Jesus, all he's done for me, my soul cries out, Hallelujah. Thank God for how oh, I'm alive. And because I'm alive, I'm alive to create life. My heart is working. The right ventricle, the left ventricle is working. Able to pump the oxygenated blood back into the heart. The blood goes into the lungs to create oxygen. And the oxygenated blood goes back into the heart and makes me alive. I can walk to the bathroom myself, can brush my own teeth. I can breathe. I'm not intravenously fed. Because you are alive, you are alive to crawl. Oh, I feel something in the atmosphere. Feel something in the atmosphere here today. And so you might feel that you have been gone with the wind, that life has been sucked out of you, but there is no situation too dead for God to solve. Doesn't matter how far it's gone, life can still come from that thing. And so you better speak death to dead situations that should be dead and speak life to dead situations that should be alive. I'm telling you when you speak you can rise even in your fire. You can rise from the ashes of sickness can rise from the ashes of joblessness. You can rise from your circumstance. 
in its etymological root then, circumstance, when you break it down from its etymological root, circum is a circle, which means you are surrounded. So some of us might be surrounded by situations, but when you look at the other syllables, Dance, which means to stand in the middle of your situation and take possession. To stand in the middle of your situation and occupy. To stand in the middle of your situation and call on the name of the Lord. I will call on the name of the Lord, who is a strong and mighty tower, the righteous run in, and they are saved. The Bible says, stand fast and see the salvation of the Lord. And so now then, now then, in Acts 27 and verse 1, as we go back to the text, the Bible says in verse 1, when it was decided that we should sail, I wonder if we got it highlighted, decided that we should sail for Italy. Which what this means is that it opens up with them making a decision and a purpose that they should sail. So they understood their purpose. I don't know if we've got that as a slide, but understand their purpose. It is about purpose. If you have to get to the other side and in, to enable you to get to the other side, you must know your purpose. Because it's your purpose that it helps to make your decision process easy. Purpose, then, is the fuel to get you there. It is the driving force that forces you through every inclement weather that you may have in your life. Or there's something about purpose. There is purpose is powerful. There is something about purpose that if you do not have a purpose and if you don't understand your purpose, that is why there are some people that commit suicide or give up because they feel that they don't have a purpose. What is life for? They, they are just existing. But today, you need to understand your purpose. Can you say amen? amen. And so we must also have a plan. So we've got purpose, but we must also have a plan. Just as a plane has a flight plan to plot and plan its journey and to know who is on board, I'm going somewhere with this, and to execute its purpose successfully, it must have a flight plan. In other words, purpose holds hands with plans. Oh, how am I going to get there? What do I need to do to get there? You've got to set some goals. In, in your flight of life, you must set some objectives. You must understand in terms of a flight plan, who is coming on board with you. This is very important. And who are you taking with you? You must have a flight manifest. Flight manifest details the passengers on board. Uh, and there are checks and detailed checks that happen with regards to that manifest because they don't want any hijackers on board. They don't want any stowaways on board. In your flight of life, you must have a manifest. You must check who is on board with you. Be careful who is on your flight because there are some people who are just with you for the wrong reasons. Little will you know it, they will sabotage your flight, sabotage your destiny, and have you right back where you started. So you've got to check their character. You've got to check 
if they are for you or if they are against you. Because if the wind blows, you are more likely to be uprooted because you haven't got people around you sowing seeds of positivity telling you you can make it. In fact, they'll just say, I told you so. Instead of saying to, well, you can do it. What about if you do it this way? Let's give you some more ideas. Listen, keep going, keep going. You've got some people in your lives that if you are not careful, they will hijack the plans that God has for you. No wonder the Bible says that you've got to try every spirit and see whether they be of God. It's not everyone in your life that smiles at you and even buys you gifts is for you. Uh, they might remember your birthday every year, but it might be because they're expecting something back when it's theirs. But you ought to have someone in your life where even if you didn't give something back, that's all right because there are what we call called zero gravity friends, which is friends they don't expect anything in return. All they expect is to see you grow and to sow seeds of positivity in your life. So you need to have the right people, the right people, the right people around you. So when we talk about headwinds then, and we're going to headwinds. Headwinds is what blows against the direction of travel. And so I studied this, and in avionics, it tells me what a, a, a headwind is to a plane. And so we're going to start with the takeoff. Everyone say takeoff. And so you would think then that headwinds hinder the plane from taking off. That it would hinder the aircraft from moving forward. That it would hinder the aircraft from going higher. But in actual fact, planes need headwinds to take off. Because it is the headwinds that create lift. Everyone say lift. And so it creates lift. So in order for the plane to take off and go higher, it must have a headwind. It is the headwinds that and the resistance that creates and enables the plane to go higher and take it from the atmosphere and take it from the troposphere and take it airborne into the stratosphere and God wants to take you to a higher level and he's going to use the headwinds to do it. Can you say amen? I'm going to show you how he does that. And so in my context today, we're talking specifically about the elements that are coming against you. These are headwinds. But the enemy meant it for evil. But God means it and works it for your good. What does uh, Romans 8.28 says? It says, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord who are called according to his purpose. So no matter what the enemy throws at you, no matter what wins you experience in life, it will work for your good. You just need to understand how it works for your good. And so the Bible says in Romans 5, it, again, it tells us that even in our suffering, ah, our suffering, it will still, even though you suffer, something good is going to come of it. Because suffering then produces perseverance. No matter what the enemy does, he's actually doing you a favor. No matter what 
plots, the enemy plots against you and what winds are coming against you, you need to see it that even though it might not feel good, but we know our end is victory. We know that it's going to work out for our good. He said perseverance, and even if you persevere, it produces character. Ah, and then character then produces hope. So the more you make me suffer, is the more I'm going to put my hope and trust in God. The more I put my hope and trust in God is the more that I will invite him into my situation. So we deal with headwinds then. How do we deal with headwinds? We don't run away from them. And we're going to go to Psalm 20 verse 1 and 9. We don't run away from them. We don't ignore them. But but we face them. We must face our headwinds. We must face our fears. We must face our enemies. I'm not talking about squaring up to them and giving the five-fold ministry. That's not what we're talking about. But you ought to put down some good old-fashioned, old-school prayer, go down on your knees and pray a prayer warrior's prayer that your prayer will confound the enemies and bring every snare. In fact, let them fall in their own trap and their own snare. I remember one time, I remember one time, just remember this testimony. Um, I had some, uh, I, I had a manager at the time and I uh, had lots of ideas, and I was saying to him, yeah, we should do this, we should do that, we should do this, we should do that. Gave him all of my ideas, and I thought, I thought he was for me. I thought he was on my side. And so then when we went into the director, I was just about to speak, and here he comes. He regurgitates all of my ideas. And I'm like, well, the devil is a liar. And so he regurgitated all my ideas, and then uh, my, the director, CEO, he then says, uh, well, what do you think, Rob? I said, yeah, what he said. You know, there was, there was nothing else for me to say. So we came out, and he said, yeah, sorry about that, Rob, I just got carried away. <laughs> yeah, right. And so it was real interesting then, because so I left it. You know, sometimes you just need to leave things to God. You know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You know, I will repay. You know, touch not the Lord's anointed. Do my prophets no harm. Look at your neighbor and tell them you're anointed. You're anointed. So there were some cutbacks. There were some cutbacks. And I thought, right, here we go. And so um, he wanted to see both me and my manager. We, he took us individually uh, one day it was him, then the following day, like, it was, it was me. So he took him for his chat, and then um, he took me afterwards. And um, I was saying to him, yeah, how did it go? How did it go? And he's told me, yeah, well, Rob, yeah, it's not looking too good, Rob. I says, oh, where did you go? He said, yeah, some dirty green, some dirty spoon calf underneath the bridge. That's where we, where did yeah, where did you go, Rob? Oh, yeah, he took me to the gauchos, you know. I was like, yeah, yeah, he took me to the gauchos, you know. Yeah, they, the servers, they brought, they brought the meat. They, they said, right, um, which, 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 which cut do you want? I uh, chose my cut. You know, he said, yeah, take anything you want, Rob. Yeah, just anything. Yeah, had my glass of wine. You know, even though it was a working day, he said, no, just have, it, have your wine. You know, we were, we were just, we were just chilling in the gauchos. <laughs> and uh, he looked at me, but I said it quite sheepishly, you know, because, you know, I, I, felt, I felt like I didn't want to, like, puff up my chest because I was like, I'm leaving this to God. And then the next week they got rid of him and I took his job. <laughs> you know, don't, don't play with God. Don't, don't, don't play with me, you know. Don't, don't play with a child of God because you mess with a child of God. You'll fall into your own trap. You'll, you'll hang your own self on the own gallows that you have prepared for me. Tell me who I am. I'm a child of God. 
don't mess with me. You mess with me, you get burned. You put me in the fire. No matter how much you turn up the fire, I'll call God in my situation and that same fire that was meant for me, it will lick you up and burn you. And all of us, oh, don't you dare, don't you mess it with me. Who are you? I feel, I feel, I feel a roadish anointing. I feel a roadish anointing. Don't you mess. With, look at someone and tell them, don't mess with me. You don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. I've had so much experience where they've laid traps for me. But good God, the more resistance they lay for me, is the higher I go. Jesus. So, where was I? Psalms 20. <laughs> Psalms 20, verse 1 and 9. It says, may the Lord answer you in your, so these are headwinds, answer you in your distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. So this is how you deal with headwinds, right? May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support or strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and burnt offerings. Hold it there. So this is how you deal with headwinds. You, even in your distress, you continue to worship God. Even, no matter what headwinds come your way, don't lose your worship. And don't put away your praise. Because your worship and your praise is the catalyst for your end. And so he says, may he give you the desires, look at the stages, May he give you the desires of your heart and make all your plans succeed. When headwinds come our way, when we started something, when we're venturing out in life and the headwinds come, we have a tendency to throw away our plans. But what God is saying Keep your plans, because despite the headwinds, he will make your plans succeed. Don't know who I'm talking to today, but whatever plans you have purposed in your life, the headwinds cannot stop it, because it's like a wind that cannot be stopped. And then he says, I love this. Wait, may we shout for joy over your victory. In other words, you have to have positive people around you that will shout not just for their victory, but will shout for yours. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but would someone just shout for your neighbor and tell them you've got the victory? <laughs> Lift up your banners, which is a banner of victory, an ensign. When you lift up your banners, you're lifting up the name of the Lord. May the Lord grant all your request. So in your headwinds, you have some requests that God will bring you out 
But look at the catalyst from sacrifice to granting all your requests. Some people, they start to blame God when things happen in their lives. I'm not going to church no more. I'm not going to worship no more. But you're throwing away the very weapon that's going to get you further and give you a breakthrough. So now then, so now then, the Bible, the Bible then, it talks to us about God giving us the victory. And that in order for us to go higher, there has to be a headwind. There has to be something that comes up against us. And it is in the Bible where things that come up against us, there is a lifting. The Bible says, when the enemy shall come in, thank you, Jesus, like a flood. Thank you, Lord. What drives a flood? Wind drives a flood. The Lord, the Bible says, the Lord will lift up a standard. But there is no standard without any flood. But once there is a flood, God comes in and lifts up a standard. So there is a lifting that happens during your headwind. Oh, I'm so glad that the Bible talks about in Isaiah 40, every valley, I don't know what valley you are in, but every valley shall be exalted. In other words, that everything in your life that is low you stay with God just for a little while. Do I have any witnesses in here that God is a God of breakthrough? You stay with God a little while, and that thing that was in the valley, it shall be exalted. Look at this here. It says also that the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him, and it also says every mountain and hill shall be made low. Look at this. Shall be made low. In other words, how is a mountain made low? And I went back to an airplane. Because when you are high on an airplane, everything that looked big to you, now you are up high, it looks small. I'm here to declare to you today that if you stay with God, every mountain that is looking down at you, you will start to look down at it. Because there is a lifting, there is a lifting, there is a lifting. They that wait on the Lord. They will mount up with eagles. So even if you are in your headwind, even if you're in the, on the runway and you're, you're in distress, things aren't working. But keep waiting. And waiting is symbolic of worshiping. Work, waiting is a symbolic of still doing the work of God. You're waiting in your spirit, but you're not waiting in movement. You're still moving forward. You're still doing what God asked for you. But they that wait on the Lord, they will mount up as wings as eagles, they will walk and not faint. They will run and not get weary. After a headwind, there shall be a lifting. I want you to understand that every enemy that comes your way, you ought to understand that they are doing you a favor. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I need my prop. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, thou walk through the valley of the... He says, he prepares a table before me. He also says, hey, listen. He says that he will make your enemies your footstool. Ah, and I feel like preaching all ready. And so every headwind that was meant for your destruction, ah, it's actually 
actually going to work out for your elevation. Every headwind that was meant for your death, it's actually going to work out in your favor because the Bible says that your enemy shall become your footstool. The Bible also says that the enemy belongs under your... You ought to thank God for your enemies. I wonder if someone could jump up on their feet right now and give God a praise in spite of what you are going through because where the enemy meant your headwinds for evil God is using your headwinds to take you off and lift you off you might have enemies at work you might have enemies at home but they belong under your feet and when they are under your feet uh -huh, you stand on your enemies and they become your footstool. In other words, every sickness, it's a footstool. Every cancer, it's a footstool. Every suicidal thought, it's a footstool. Because when it's all over, I'm going to go higher into the stratosphere because it's there to take you higher. Would somebody lift up the name of the Lord and stand on your situation? He belongs under your feet. He doesn't belong above you, but he belongs under your feet. The more enemies you have is the higher you go. So you might have sickness to the left, sickness to the right, you might be caught up in a whirlwind, trouble coming from all angles, but you better celebrate because they're just footstools. In fact, God has given you building blocks for your success and for you to go higher. How do I go higher? The more you disturb me, brings me closer to God. The more you trouble me, is the more I go to Nice City. The more you disturb me, is the more I'll pray. Before I had enemies, I was far from God. God, but my enemies became my footstool because they taught me how to pray. I had an excuse. I wasn't praying. I wasn't doing what I should be. And I had an excuse that I don't know what to pray for. And as a result of me thinking I don't know what to pray for, I drifted far from the Lord. But what God said, I died that you might have life and have more abundantly. I'm not finished with you yet. And so what he does in order for me to go higher, he brings some enemies to give me a reason to praise the Lord, to give me a reason to pray to him. Because the more I pray to him is the more God elevates me. If there is anyone here today that thinks they haven't got a reason to give God a praise, Watch out, your enemy is coming and God will say to you that your enemies will become your footstool. And so I'm finished here, but I want to end with this, is that the enemy, even in your tailwind, a tailwind now, so a headwind, you use all of your energy to take off and so you're trying to take off and you're fighting this person and you're fighting this devil and you're trying to do this and you're trying to do that you're using so much fuel at the runway you use more fuel than when you are airborne because when you are airborne you are now soaring and so some of us the reason 
why we don't remain airborne and cannot take advantage of our tailwind is because we're still fighting. God wants to lift you up, but you're still on ground level. But what God is saying, that you're fighting so much that when you get up there, you got nothing left, but you need to let go and let God. Oh, you need to let go and let God. And so there are some things in our lives where the enemy is trying to sow seeds in our minds, but you need to use every tool and every arsenal to get you higher because it is things below that's keeping you down. So in other words, headwinds are there to take you higher, but tailwinds are there to take you further, but you can't raise, you can't go further if you have, uh, if you can't raise yourself higher. In other words, there are some things, thank you Jesus, that you need to conquer. There are, you're depressed, it's holding you down, and you can't go further. You've got suicidal thoughts, it's holding you down, but you can't go further. Just like dust, if you were able to pick up dust and throw it in the air, it's only when it goes up in the air that it begins to travel but God wants you on ground level he's saying you're a nobody and so you can't go further but I'm about to give you a strategy that will get you up into the atmosphere into the troposphere into the mesosphere and into a higher dimension some years ago when I was going through my own stuff they gave me an idea and said what you need to do is so that you know that you are of worth and are of value these things are holding you back negativity is holding you back but you need something to release you so you can rise above Above the things that's holding you down because you can't go further unless you rise up but once you rise up oh, oh Jesus you can go further so what they told me they gave me this idea this is so special to me I came across this and inside what they told me was to get a jar and every time someone says something good about you write it down and put it in a jar every good experience you go through write it down and put it in a jar because this is a way of releasing you to to go further <laughs> the devil is a liar and he is an accuser of the brethren so every now and then when the enemy whispers I open there's something powerful about memory when you remember who you are and remember whose you are so every now and then I'll open up my jar and look at what people have said about me look at what the Bible had a said about me. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. I tell you, this is a strategy to encourage yourself. Thank you, Jesus because you can't take the band with you when you're out there. Wasn't it David who said that he was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him, but he encouraged himself in the Lord. You want to go back to your mental Rolodex and go into the word and see what the word says about you. 
you uh, you're cooking dinner <laughs> encourage yourself uh, don't wait till you come into the house of the Lord I'm fed up of those who say church is dry or the spirit weren't moving well you make up the body of Christ and so if the spirit ain't moving it's got nothing to do with the spirit it must have something to do with your lazy self but you ought to get up out of your seat and stop blaming and everybody else uh, and look at yourself uh, how will enter uh, in his gates uh, with thanksgiving uh, I will enter uh, in his courts with praise uh, the church is only on fire uh, if you bring the fire uh, if you got no fire uh, there ain't no fire uh, don't rely on the band uh, but before you come into the house of the Lord, uh, I don't care what headwinds you are in, uh, but in order for you to go further, uh, put a praise song on, uh, start churching uh, before you come to church, uh, cause this is just a building, uh, but you are the church. Uh, the son of the living God. I don't get it. I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Where people wait until they come in to give God a praise. But the Bible says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. So you have breath when you're out there. You praise the Lord. You have breath in your workplace. Praise the Lord. You have breath in the dance club. Praise the Lord. Because let everything have breath. And so praise is a weapon. Praise is a weapon. This is training ground. And out there is the battlefield. And if you ain't got praise, you'll lose. But you show me a victor. I show you a praiser. So before you go further in life, you have to rise above your enemies. If you're still fighting enemies, you can't go further. So you have to rise above suicidal thoughts. Use every arsenal you can. Use the preacher. Use your neighbor. Use a counselor. Use a therapist. Another thing that gets on my nerves, that those people that talk down therapists, good God, do you know it's good to talk? It's good to confess your faults one to another another the devil is a liar someone's got to be released from something right now in order for them to go forward because when the cross winds come and they blow you off course the bible says look not to the left nor to the right but fix your eyes on the prize wasn't it in the gospel where the invalid replied sir I have no one to bring me when the water is stirred thank you Jesus and so he said get up once he got up he then said take up your mat and walk if there is no get up. You cannot walk forward. Get up. From your sin, from your shackles, from unforgiveness, get up. Because you can't walk forward. Get up. From vengeance. Get up. From hate. Don't belong to you. You're a child of God. Get up from trauma. God said, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. 
It's only when he got up that he was able to walk and took off his grave clothes. In order for you to go forward, there are some grave clothes that need to come off you right now. Take them off. Take them off. Take off those grave clothes. We can do the churchy. And we can put on our churchy clothes. But not God is not looking for churchiness or religiosity. What God is looking for is transformation. Transformation. So your grave clothes, we need to take them off. Because they don't belong to you. They were put on you by trauma. They were put on you by words of negativity. And they have become a lingering memory to stop you going higher and going further. But in your season today, take off your grave clothes. Understand the season that you are in. If you're in a season where it is a headwind, then you need to understand that God is trying to take you higher. And there are some things that you need to change before you can go further. Would you lift your arms up in the air if, you, if you've learned something today? Amen. Would you just give God a praise? If anyone's learned anything today, anything today, anything today. And so today, as we, as we close, it was a little longer than expected. But as we close today, if there's anyone that doesn't know Jesus, come to the front. And we have members of the pastoral team who are at the front here. If you're looking to become a member, come to the front here. Church, I love you all. May you have a victorious week. And most of all, may your future be better than your past.